Thank you very much, uh, Anna Maria. Uh, you also sent us uh, your uh, research results uh, in an email lately. I think it's already up on our uh, website. So um, you can. Uh, for, no, it's not. Christina says it's not. It will. It will be. And now I have to apologize to Ryan Gauthier because he was actually next in line, and he comes from the biggest country of all. Uh, and at least when you count the surface, and 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 and, and uh, that is Canada. Uh, Ryan Gauthier is. Um, do I pronounce it or do you say yeah. Gauthier? Uh, do I do you use English, French, whatever? French, whatever works for you. Ryan Gauthier, Beyond Gauthier, <laughs> uh, from Thompson Rivers uh, University, uh, assistant professor, has also been following the Play the Game project for uh, some years now. And we are very glad that you can uh, present what you found. Thank you. It's not the first time I've been uh, forgotten by playing the game. I'm looking at one person in particular. It's not your fault, I know. It's all, it's all in good fun. Um, so like the others, um, I've completed preliminary data. I'll be talking about outreach to the sport organizations in a moment. Um, but I've looked at eight national sport organizations, the six um, recommended by um, Play the Game, including the Canada Olympic Committee, and the two I've swapped in for Canadian purposes are ice hockey and curling, for what I hope are pretty obvious reasons, but also to get a little bit more winter sport in the mix, because winter sport is, for understandable reason, often overlooked by most, um, by most states. Um, even with the data sheet I have sent in, I'm keeping the organizations anonymous for now, because the data is not finalized, and I don't want to point fingers at people without incomplete information. But I'm certainly happy to chat about organizations uh, more off the record. Um, Canadian sport is a bit of a weird beast. It's a mixture between um, a British organizational system and an American organizational system. It's federated. There's no, nothing in the Constitution that says who oversees sports. Up until the 1960s, the federal government said, municipalities, provinces, you look after sport, and sport you're on your own. But it, it was only in the 1960s when Canada noted its pretty horrible performance at the Olympic Games that it said, maybe we should put some money into sports. They passed a sport act which said, we should pay attention to sport. And that's really about it. And aside from providing money to sport, that's probably the most important thing that the Canadian government has arguably done. And while most of the sport organizations are federal in nature, a lot of the day-to-day -day work is run by provincial organizations. And I think that might explain maybe why we look very similar to Germany, because Germany is also a federated state. So you want to hear about the results, you want the numbers. So the numbers are 37% overall. That's weak, bordering on moderate, right on line with Germany. That was my response too when I saw the, the numbers. Transparency was 38, democracy was 40, accountability was 38, and social responsibility was 31. Across the eight organizations, I would say two were sort of overall a, a good showing, sort of what they would get a kind of a, a light green light. Four were moderate and two were weak. Um, and the two that were weak are weak in large part because I can't find their documents at all. Um, I'll get into that in a moment. So overall, I think that the score is not as dire as it looks. I think it's, it's probably closer to moderate, maybe closer to Romania in the last study, a little bit stronger than Germany perhaps, because if I could confirm more of the data, the scores would be boosted. Um, some of the indicators, uh, the organizations, they almost met the indicator, they maybe meet five times a year, they met four. That's not a complaint about the indicators at all, it's just the, the nature of indicators. So there's a, a few near misses, and, um, and I, I'm very happy to talk with the other um, researchers about this, they don't want to talk to me. Um, only one organiz two organizations 
entered into a dialogue, one gave me feedback on, on the information so far, the rest I've contacted a couple of times, mostly through the board, and they seem to want very little to do with this at the moment. Um, so I'm very happy for feedback on how to improve that. Um, so I'm going to break it in like my Australian colleague and sort of hits and misses on each dimension on the, on the transparency side. Most of the organizations publish their constitution, publish their statutes on the website. Um, if I remember, six out of eight did so. So that's pretty good. And generally, some information was published on membership. Again, it's a little weird because it's a federated system. So the numbers aren't as robust as one would like. You'd have to go and look at all 10 provinces and possibly three territories. But you can at least get some of the numbers. You can figure out what's going on. On the negative side, board decisions are rarely published. And rules, reports on executive pay are also very rarely published. On the democracy aspect, um, quorum and general assembly meetings are well met. That's pretty standard. You see that in most Canadian not-for-profit organizations. Pretty normal. What was surprising on the negative side was steps to achieve a balanced composition of the board. Very few things were set out in writing, although I think informally a lot of this is done. Most of the boards are fairly diverse. I know the organizations, that's very much at top of mind. There just hasn't been anything formally about that. Um, and one major negative on democracy was um, the, participa the participation of stakeholders in the policy process or the lack thereof. And that's probably very much due to the historical nature of Canadian sport. As was mentioned at earlier um, presentations, sport, um, I think in the UK it was mentioned, was very much run sort of like out of someone's garage or at the kitchen table, and only recently has it become professionalized. Canada's very much the same way, only becoming more professionalized, regularized in the 1980s. In terms of accountability, um, separation of powers, internal audit committee are positives. Most organizations met those. But financial control rules, which is a little bit of a surprise, but also annual evaluation of board performance composition were not as strong with most of the organizations. And finally, societal responsibility. Almost all of the organizations had a readily available sexual harassment policy, just like the US, this is at top of mind in Canada right now with um, sexual abuse in gymnastics amongst others. And in ice hockey about 20 years ago, this was a big issue. So no surprise that the organizations are focusing on that. But as far as societal responsibility, about everything else is not very strong. But again, I think this goes back to um, my American colleague and this different idea of what sport governing bodies are expected to do in Canada. A lot of sport in Canada is very professionally minded. You're going to become a professional tennis player. You're going to be a national hockey league player, which will take you out of that amateur sports system very soon. And, and that's been very seen as the goal of sport is turning amateurs into professionals and not serving amateurs necessarily for um, a, a long time in sports. Now, again, any experts on Canadian sport or any Canadian sport organizations, feel free to correct my understanding at any point, but that's the, the way I, I see it at the moment. So to wrap this up and give a, a quick concluding thought or two, um, I think the Canadian sport organizations do have most of the basics down. The score doesn't look that encouraging, but I think it's stronger than the numbers suggest. Um, sport Canada does have an accountability framework tied to funding, but it's very open-ended at the moment, and they're revising it. So I think that we will likely see improvements in the near future once Sport Canada revises its accountability framework. And um, again, I think if they, the organizations were more open, at least at, at the upfront about cooperating, I think we would see stronger scores. So again, I very much look forward to feedback from that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. I think we should immediately send a, a, an express note to Germany because it has been a matter of concern in Germany that uh, they were behind Poland uh, <laughs> here. And, and, I'll email you. And, and uh, yes, and that has actually caused fierce protest notes 
uh, from German Sport to the Deutsche Sport to the German Sport University Cologne. Um, I don't know if they have really clarified it. I've, I have yet to see uh, uh, any arguments uh, like why it should be wrong what they found in, in Germany. But but this, I think they would have preferred that preferred that it was not published. But that was. Uh, that's the name of the game uh, here. By us, we, we do publish. Yeah, is that school the German club? Is that with cooperation? With the cooperation of the Nigeria? It was with some cooperation with some of them, and, and some of them uh, denied. And 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 this is, uh, uh, I mean, if we said that we would not make our surveys without cooperation, we would not be able to make surveys because there would. At speed of sound be an agreement that you don't answer this word. We have seen that those attempts numerous times. So, and, and it's also so that it shows something about the level of transparency. If you need a lot of cooperation to get the, uh, because many of the documents and things should just be on the website. And so these things reflect on each other. We appreciate a lot when the uh, federations that actually cooperate. It's the same situation with the international federations that, that well, those who do not cooperate, they may suffer uh, in terms of percents, but so be it. Again, we are not talking about exact science and to some extent it also reflects a, a, a governance reality if uh, an organization does not want to go into a dialogue. Uh, we're not, we are not pestering them every week. It's a question of uh, every, well, we have, it's every three years, maybe, that they get a no. So, but I uh, will not, uh, we can take that under the, the debate. I will go now and uh, to the, uh, we are close to the goal line with the presentations. Anatoly Korebanov is the is founder of uh, the uh, sports development in, uh, NGO in um, Georgia, the real Georgia. Not the one on your mind, maybe, but <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> but, but the, the the beauty beautiful Georgia situated um, very very eastern part of Europe, um, and and um, uh, I had the pleasure of visiting Georgia twice actually uh, last uh, year, and uh, it's a beautiful country. It is also in a complicated geopolitical. Uh, situation, uh, but uh, Anatoly has been very active in the Council of Europe, and you made the connection by that. And you have formerly worked for government, and now you are on your own. But you have also already uh, made great political uh, progress, uh, in fact, with uh, the, your study, which was published in February, I think. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anatoly. Uh, as Jens mentioned, uh, I was a leading researcher. I was the only one who ran the study in Georgia. Uh, and uh, I will take advantage of the opportunity that my study, uh, Georgian study, is uploaded on the Play the Game website. It's final. So you can download it and look, go through each and every detail. So I will, be, uh, I will keep short my presentation. Uh, for the next maybe seven, eight minutes, I will touch upon maybe three points. One is how the environment, legal and cultural environments, um, impact the good governance in Georgia. Another one, I will touch upon the oral results, uh, how our federations are doing. And finally, I will speak about uh, father, uh, father advancing uh, good governance in Georgia and the legacy of NSGO project. So, but before I would like to make sure that we have the same Georgia on, my, uh, on our mind and uh, I will tell that uh, uh, my country is, situate, uh, is located on the edge between the Asia and Europe. We belong ourselves to Europe and it's an interesting fact that uh, we have archaeological studies that found first Europeans in Georgia so we are the country with our own alphabets and our own language. We speak only 
The population of Georgia is 3.5 million and we speak our own language. Just to make some other interesting uh, facts about Georgia, it's an independent state and uh, we have contributed to the development of humanity. I would say that uh, there are four, point, four items on the intangible cultural heritage of humanity by UNESCO. We have our own Georgian alphabet and writing system as the uh, intangible uh, cultural heritage. We have our own way of making wine. So you are kindly invited to Georgia to taste the unique wine. And uh, we are also very famous for our polyphonic um, sings. And as regard to sports, we have our Georgian national uh, wrestling style. It's uh, also on the uh, cultural heritage lists of UNESCO. So, and we have a strong tra sports traditions in Georgia. Um, all in all, for, for sport, we are well known, uh, our, weight, uh, our wrestlers and uh, judokas and also weightlifters are uh, very well known uh, all over the world. So, yeah, before, and most important thing that we are very hospitable people in Georgia and you are kindly invited to Georgia and you can see, uh, I put, in the Georgian al alphabet, the following uh, uh, sentence Ketili ihost kweni mobzaneba sakartoloshi This is how we pronounce Welcome to Georgia So you are kindly <laughs> invited to Georgia uh, Going uh, to sport and the legal system We, know to, we have to understand the environments uh, where the sport organizations are working because it really do impact on the way how they perform First of all, the sports system in Georgia uh, is the system where the public agencies are very actively engaged in regulating the sport. The sport organizations are heavily uh, dependent on the public funds. Uh, maybe 90% of their funding are coming from the government, from the state's fund. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a really uh, important point. The, le the leading agency for, for, for sport is the Ministry for Education, uh, Science, Culture and Sport. We have uh, one law, main, main law which regulates sports, it's law on sport. And also I would say that uh, Civil Code of Georgia, which uh, regulates the way how uh, non-for-profit organizations are set and uh, operated, it also influences the good governance of sport organizations and in a while I will tell you and show you how it influences. Uh, yeah, there are some bylaws uh, adopted by the Ministry of Sport, adopted by the government, so they regulate the system as well. There are 82 sports uh, federations recognized by the Georgian authorities and out of uh, them 60 get public funds uh, for, for their activities. So. The government tries to uh, set a set of standards with, uh, in cooperation with the sport federations. They used to have an agreement with some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of uh, rules for making sure that they uh, adopt, adopt or apply some standards. Even it goes to the good garden standards. Unfortunately, currently, uh, the good garden standards uh, which are in place are very broad, introduced by the ministry, it was introduced maybe in 2015. They are very broad and sometimes it's very difficult to measure how, uh, how th these or that federations are performed uh, and sometimes it makes uh, confusion while, evaluation, uh, while evaluating the performance of different types of uh, federations. Just to give you a taste of this uh, uh, the system, for example, if there are two federations, one is uh, organizing two training sessions on doping and another have a whole educational program, they will be treated as the equal. So this is the best thing of the current system. And we need more clear principles, more clear uh, indicators to measure and to ensure that everyone has uh, are treated equally. Uh, I would tell you that you will be surprised that Georgia, with the NG NSGO results, is the first, but from the behind. <laughs> so, uh, I will come back to the results, uh, just make uh, uh, sure and speak about that uh, the 
project was implemented by the uh, Strategic Analysis Center with a partnership of uh, Council of Europe and the Parliament of Georgia. Um, and uh, yes, thanks for their support. And uh, yeah, to the results, you can see that uh, the okay. The, there were five uh, sport federations participated in the study. It's athletics, aquatic. Uh, it's federations responsible for athletics, for aquatics, football, handball, and tennis. Uh, only the football federation uh, denied to cooperate with the uh, with the project. Uh, so the results are based on the publicly publicly available data. Uh, as to the other federation, they are, were very open cooperating with the project, cooperating with the researcher, so they provided all the data. Uh, are we, opting, are we uh, satisfied with the results? Not for sure, but we are optimistic, because with this result we see from where we are, what are the challenges, and we are thinking about how to address these challenges. So here you can see the overall NSGO index, it means that we gathered all these five federations and you can see these over, overall results. For transparency, it's 21 uh, percent. Uh, it's interesting thing that uh, the uh, the federation used to have uh, their annual uh, action plans, their strategies. They do report on their activities according to the agreement with the Ministry for Sport, but they don't uh, they don't uh, publish it on their website. Unfortunately, what they do uh, with the 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 internal um, uh, they used to provide the internal stakeholders all minutes and status of the general assemblies we have internal communications and this is the reason uh, and it's impacted by the civil code because civil codes of Georgia oblige the non-governmental organizations non-for-profit organization to inform it it sets the rules uh, how to invite the general assembly meetings of, of, of particular non um, of non uh, for profit organizations. Uh, also, it's an interesting fact that uh, yeah, it's about culture. You know, the federation has all these uh, reports, all these strategies, but they don't publish. When I asked why I'm not why I'm not publishing these uh, reports, it was. We don't know, okay, it's a good idea to put it on the website, why not? I said, yes, for sure, you have to, because then you will ensure the transparency of your key documents, it will increase the credibility uh, of your organization, and so on and so forth. But uh, maybe if not the, the civil code of Georgia, which uh, lies the standards how to, um, how to invite the, the General Assembly meetings, maybe we will... Uh, we would have uh, lower results for transparency. As to the democracy, uh, democratic processes, I would say that the, uh, uh, it is the, compared to other dimensions, we have this, the highest score. It's also thanks to the civil code of Georgia, which, uh, yeah, uh, which uh, obliged some, um, and sets minimum requirements to uh, for the organization about the re-elections and appointment of the board members on providing data of the board members and I mean, personal data of the board members and so on and so forth. So, uh, as to the code of uh, civil code, it's for example, it's uh, said that, it's said that uh, for example, non-for-profit uh, organizations should indicate supreme government body its functions, it should indicate also the, the quorum, meeting uh, intensity, and so on. With the, the democratic processes, the main challenge is that, um, for example, we have no uh, procedures in place for, for uh, enhancing diverse boards. Uh, we have lack of participation of internal stakeholders. We the federations do not ensure participation of athletes and uh, participation of coaches and so on and so forth. Uh, the internal accountability, you can see that the both uh, dimensions uh, are not fulfilled according to the um, scale or system of the, of the NSGO. And um, 
Yeah, for the rest of the results, you can uh, refer to the uh, fi uh, final report. I would like to mention the legacy of NSGO. First of all, that uh, we had a hearing about the final report of Georgia in the Parliament of, of Georgia in the, uh, the, at the Committee of Sports. And uh, after the hearings, they addressed the Ministry of Sport with particular recommendations uh, saying that you need to uh, set more clear standards, good governance standards, you need to uh, raise awareness about the good governance among the key stakeholders, among the, uh, the sport federations, and uh, you need to support financially and technically those federations who are eager to apply more uh, good governance standards. So this is very important. Uh, at the end of the project, the Handball Federation came to me with a request to support them to implement more stand good governance standards. And uh, uh, for today, I am working and providing some consultancy to the hand National Handball Federations on improving their good governance system. Is uh, the only federation who expressed their will. As to the plans for 2020, the Committee on Sport of the Parliament of Georgia invited me to uh, work with them and uh, conduct the study in 20 federations, sport federations. So we will take uh, the federations from different capacities, find the, let's say, the strengths, the weaknesses of these federations, and based on these results and the evidences, uh, we are going to elaborate a code of good governance. But prior, we also uh, are going for the next year to, um, to make a review of good practices uh, of different countries, how you have established your codes and how it works in practice. So I would be very happy if you can share with me during the next days how you work, how the system works in your countries. So I would really do appreciate it. Hopefully, by the end of 2020, we'll have a code of sport governance in Georgia setting compulsory minimal standards for the sport federations who are getting public funds. Thank you very much for your attention. The, the time management has been a little bit slack uh, from the moderator. Uh, so I will invite uh, everybody to come up, uh, all the speakers, uh, so we can uh, have a round of quick questions, debate, comments. Um, yes, please come, come to the... I think uh, for us to play the game at least, it's uh, really wonderful to see all the commitment and energy that has put into this and uh, uh, the results uh, that, that give something to, to work with. Um, yeah. All right. Um, anyone in the room who has questions, comments? Roger, do you? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, do we have a, a microphone just for the recording? Let's have a, uh, have a methodological question uh, request. Is it possible for each of you to put your full spreadsheets with results across all the indicators on the web so that those of us who play with numbers can do some compare and contrast? I'm particularly interested in the question, if you sample from the 284 indicators, um, what's the minimum number you need to have a result that's statistically consistent with the overall result? To get to Spencer's question, which we could do if we had access to all of your data sets. Well, so the, a possibility? Um, there is a limitation here, which we have discussed a lot. Uh, as far as I know, we have at those who are partners, and I'm sure you can convince Spencer to make some work with them, but those who are official partners get access to all the international uh, results. I think there was a discussion in the research group, but I have to check up on that, uh, where there was an overall feeling that the individual ticks 
uh, in the boxes. Uh, at that level, it should not uh, be uh, uh, fully transparent. Uh, personally, I would prefer that everything was just uh, very open, but there were some reasons for it, and to be honest, it's two years ago since we had that, that discussion, I don't remember the finer details, but uh, Christina is here, and uh, she will remind uh, uh, me when I come home about the... Uh, we, we, we can have that discussion about how we can do it. But we, we seek as much transparency as possible, as possible, especially so so you can actually make these comparisons uh, uh, across the countries. I mean, that, that's, that's a prerequisite uh, uh, for that. But I think there is, there is uh, the most detailed level, I think, is not shared, uh, as far as I remember. So the results, um, a real, real challenge obviously was getting the cooperation of the national sport organizations. It seems like maybe Daryl, uh, Australia, I, I didn't capture in my notes, what level of cooperation did you get? And are there any ways to compel greater cooperation from the national sport organizations, whether it be through mandates from, from the national or through financial incentives, or through uh, hiring someone who could be deployed to help these different organizations. Um, why don't we start with you, Daryl, and I'm curious to know yeah, if others sure. could give a... Uh, well, in my case, we, we, we're just getting to that stage now of actually um, interviewing the, um, the different NSOs to fill what we regard as gaps in the information. Um, and that's a crucial part, as, as Ian said. Um, there is a, um, I guess there's a de facto compliance uh, measure in Australia in that um, the peak body, which used to be called the Australian Sports Commission, now Sport Australia, has mandatory governance principles expected of all uh, NSOs that it provides funding towards. And it works um, with them to ensure that they achieve that. And we only receive high level information, the public, um, but what we, uh, because I've, I've actually had a discussion with Sport Australia, they're quite enthusiastic for us to move ahead with this, so we would have the imprimatur. So I'm not anticipating perhaps as much resistance as some of my colleagues here have received. Even more a question of logistics uh, rather than some sort of ideological opposition because reporting on governance is, um, is something that Sport Australia has led front now for the past five years or so. So we're going to be just adding value by, um, I guess, having another uh, a lens through which to examine this, uh, which is one of the reasons I was quite excited to become involved with this. Um, are, there, are there any comments uh, from the panel on which measures, how, how we can best enhance cooperation with the federations? I think one of the things that worked um, in the US is sharing the results as they were without the and comparing that to an NGB that had four filters. Mm. And that drove um, three NGBs to respond quicker than they well, had responded previously. Um, so that was really an incentive. I would really have a problem, even if there was the money available, I would really have a problem with financial incentives. Unless the financial incentives were to improve the government practice. And it was the strongest tie to make sure that that was about improving the government's practice. Of my approach was a bit different. I approached them saying, okay, you have a lack of resources, I will do your job, I will put the practical information on the gaps and on the strengths and weaknesses of, the, of your performance, so then you can use it. So for some federations it works, for some no, but you know, it's a good approach You say that you, I will carry on your job. So at the end of the uh, study you will get free of charge results and study. Uh, regarding financial incentives, I must say it has been very efficient in the countries where the governments say we are going to make a good governance act and link it to public funding. Yeah. Uh, that is uh, an, another way of having financial incentive. Yeah. It's a, you could say it's a threatening way, uh, uh, but 
it also reflects the reality that governments, to a large extent, are actually worried about the the inner life of the sports organizations. If sports organizations become kind of a haven for for mismanagement, uh, uh, crime, uh, etc., which happens in some of the not so regulated and rich uh, sports federations. Um, I'm talking about football, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, um, it was interesting to see in Poland, our researchers there were really nervous before the first seminar because the government had sort of put a, a, an invitation which they could not deny uh, the federations. So our researchers were anxious that the federations would meet up with all the parades. Uh, the lifter, but, uh, or what do you say? Uh, that's what do you call this in, in, in boxing? With the uh, boxing? No, then, no, 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 never mind. <laughs> they, they would have a very defensive approach to this, um, and and uh, and actually, the result was the contrary. Probably they wouldn't have come if there had not been government pressure. But they engaged happily, as I told, and very, very uh, committed to finding uh, the solutions. Um, I think it, it, it's, it varies very much with the national context. I think we have in Colombia, we have a very cooperative uh, National Olympic Committee yes. and that also helps because the, the federations wants to please the National Olympic Committee. Uh, and it also creates an atmosphere that even if we are from sport, then it's okay to work with these guys from universities. I have a question for you, which is a more uh, subjective uh, uh, thing. We have discussed the relation between benchmarking and paperwork and reality of the sports organizations. Given your personal impression of sport in your country, do you feel that this work more or less reflects uh, what your the picture of the reality would be, or do you think this is work that is at risk of, of, of showing much better or much worse reality uh, than, than sport has? That was too complicated. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll Ryan, go first. Yeah. I, I think I've, I mentioned in my presentation near the end I, I think the results show Canada in a slightly more negative light. Um, there's less formalization of processes, less formalization of procedures, but I think they're practically doing a lot of things well. And that's not be, me being defensive. I'll be the first one to say why the Canadians are not doing things well. Um, so I, I think in that regard, Canada is functioning better than it shows. Um, again, that's not a slight on the indicators at all. Um, it's, 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 again, I think attributable to the history of Canada and, and the way sport has been organized. That's been very informal until recently. I think they're just catching up with the formalities and putting some good practices actually down into it. I think the measure does a really good job of, um, kind of looking at where NGVs are in terms of their proactive policies and the documentation on that. Um, what it's not designed to do and it, it can't possibly do is, is look at how well something is implemented and the behaviours of the cultures around it. Like I said in my presentation, I think it's a beautiful question and if we could have a tool, we could do that with the Olympic cultures. It was a really good tool for Georgia. It showed the reality, I'd say. There is some maybe points we should consider that due to the lack of financial and human resources at Sport Federation, they were a bit complicated with the uh, with some principles, uh, for example, the taking care of the environment, making some policies, so, you know, it's yeah, a bit complicated, but still it shows the reality, it helps and it really helped the, the public authority to see where are the federations right now. And it was the interesting fact that during the, uh, uh, the hearing session at the Committee of Sport, we had uh, a guest from the state audit who made an audit in some federation and he directly uh, 
said that if sport federations applied those standards and principles, it would be much better and will, they will perform really better. And the problems that the um, national federations are facing today are really um, connected with uh, neglecting these principles. So it is a really good tool and we are going to, to use it again. We, we were discussing the number of indicators. I just explained briefly that in the first sports governance observer, the Internet National Survey 2015, we had less than 100 uh, uh, indicators. But there was for each indicator then a grading from 1 to 5 that would also have to be described uh, why it was chosen to have a good or, or, or bad score, which made the whole exercise a bit more subjective. So we tried by having tick boxes exercise to be very, very precise and exact uh, and, and leave very little to, to, to estimates and, and uh, feelings. But uh, do you have to share the feeling of uh, Spencer also that, that we should considerably uh, reduce the number of indicators? Definitely for the small organizations. I don't think so, so much. I mean, it's there, there does know. Personally, I found for the most part, so long as I could actually find the document, I could plug through it pretty quickly by the time I was on my third or fourth organization. I knew where to find what I needed to find. Um, so having the yes, no, and reducing the processing power of the researcher, frankly, helped. Uh, my opinion is uh, we do have the, the instrument. Uh, of course, uh, we can claim it's not perfect. But the worst thing we can do is start uh, adding or reducing numbers. That's, that creates the, uh, again, the, the, we will, uh, then all the process we had until now, it will be a short-term process because we cannot compare the data we had in 2017, 19, and afterwards. I could say we should keep it because it's not the, the, the criteria what way important, but the culture of the organization uh, which revealed itself through the going of those criteria. So that's the most important uh, revelation from this research. We I just mention yeah. that I think I, I hear all of that and it all makes sense, but we're approaching this from a, a top-down perspective. And if we're saying NGB cooperation is critical, and we don't get an accurate read on the two without the NGB population. We have to see it from the NGB's perspective as well. And if an NGB has four members of staff, and we're expecting them to go through 274 indicators, I think that's an exception to the rules. We, uh, I would argue that, 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 that all the indicators, are, I mean, it's not 274 different questions. It's, 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 it's still... Uh, it actually is, once you're looking through the data set, it actually is good to put yes or no against it, and you're looking at the evidence mm -hmm. for each one. Um, okay, that's an issue for further discussion, but, but, uh, but uh, I would say the, 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 fir the former uh, uh, exercise was just as complicated, mm -hmm. uh, but, but perhaps more hidden, uh, hidden from uh, the federations, what it was about. And we do have uh, a comply or explain the principle that, that we, we do from the start, we know that not all questions are relevant for all organizations and it is possible to sort of say uh, this one is not uh, met. But that's very uh, technical. We are already five minutes into the coffee break and uh, you serve coffee now. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, sharing uh, the results. Uh, it was uh, very interesting uh, for some of us at least to uh, follow. I hope for, uh, for all of us. I look forward to the uh, continued uh, cooperation, the publications we're going to make. Uh, the, the, the we have, uh, just for, for your information, right now we do not no longer have a governance uh, uh, survey expert uh, play the game, uh, but uh, we are looking for one, and uh, but so we may have a short few months break in, in the practical uh, work of this. Uh, but uh, that might be a relief for some of you. Uh, <laughs> yes, good. But um, yeah, thanks a lot to all of you. Enjoy the coffee break. Thank you.